This is Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 276 at block height 695,158 on Tuesday, August 10th. What is up, guys? Oh, just enjoying smoky Colorado. I mean, well, yeah, it's the Smoky Mountains out here right now. Lots of smoke in the air, wildfire smoke. But it's also just uh, enjoying the rumblings from... The Twitterverse of the infrastructure bill and all that. So that's what I've been doing. What's been up on your end? Janine, Fudd? The corn prices, what's up? Oh, that tricky corn. Although we do not speak of price, so that is all. I what? do enjoy the ever fireside presence of Colorado's environment. It's very nice. It's mystic. Well, like the price. Something, something. Proper forest management. Something, something. Yeah, something, something. Externalities we got to deal with. But yeah, I guess uh, demand is up. Supply is down. Price, therefore, reactionary. But. And this has got something to do with, I guess some people are thinking it's got something to do with this infrastructure bill, huh? I mean, it's like, oh, well, there's, they've been talking crypto in the news for, well, I guess on C-SPAN for the past week. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it uh, just passed the Senate today. Um, no amendment made it in. And, um, yeah, I just have to say, man, like... I have never been this disappointed at so many people in this space. Like, just the entire situation around this bill, everywhere I look, is just total naivety on, like, every level. Like it's really kind of mind-boggling um like for for instance the the loomis um amendment proposal um let's just say she is the only person i trust involved with that um to me widen did they both take campaign donations from a truest financial um a bank holding company that owns 15 banks and berkshire hathaway in the other case um, and when you really look at the language of that amendment, um, it did not do what it was supposed to do. Um, their, their definition of a node is a piece of software that validates transactions on the ledger and nothing else performs no other functions, no other services. Um, well, nodes have to broadcast blocks and transactions for this to work, which is a service or function other than validating things. So it didn't even, in the strict language, actually do what it was supposed to. And then on top of that, all of the effort was put into that amendment and pushing it. And Ted Cruz's to strike the entire cryptocurrency um provisions period was just ignored it was it was called by the lobbyists not politically viable so that's kind of a ridiculous argument when you know that <laughs> somebody's going to object to this there's probably not going to be an amendment anyway which is exactly what happened so why not put the weight behind the proper thing to do the 
thing that actually has an effect. And it, it's just, it, it, it's absurd. Um, <laughs> like just how naive so many people in this space were around this whole situation. And it, it just blows my mind. Like all, all of the effort that was put into this amendment from Loomis for this bill, fuck Washington. Go local. Go after your county government, your state government. Get involved in that level. Like, the fucking cannabis is legal in half this country. You know why? Because people acted locally and convinced states to literally pass laws openly in defiance of federal law on a matter. And that's not just something happening with fucking cannabis. That's something happening with guns all over the place. All the counties in fucking Virginia that refused to enforce, like outright the sheriffs refused to enforce any of the gun restrictions that were voted in in the last year or so in Virginia. Uh, Missouri passing a state law, making it a federal, I mean, a state crime for federal agents to come into Missouri and try to enforce federal gun law restrictions. Like, it, it stop wasting time with the bloated machine in Washington start thinking locally and it, it just it blows my mind how many people are just futilely arguing with politicians in washington like that will accomplish anything yeah i think i was also pretty uh just uh not in a disillusion seeing a bunch of uh crypto people and uh you know bitcoiners just like trying to work the legislation where it is like uh it's always just been politicians taking money from this infrastructure from these banks for the most part that has been helping drive this legislation in a way that's going to stifle the industry i mean like the way the bill got passed right now i mean it's aside from the bad legislation amendments that were added i mean aside from that happening this was probably the second worst thing that could happen yeah i mean um you know, the way it stands right now is like minors are supposed to report, um, you know, the information of who these transactions are, which is going to wreck people. And yeah, I mean, if you look at it and you think locally and you start to think, uh, you know, game theoretically about the way this country's going, I mean, you know, Wyoming and Texas look pretty well set up. I mean, just from their senators' arguments and understandings of the way that they should be participatory in the system. And I mean, it was also just upsetting seeing a bunch of people take the you know, polarizing position of not supporting Ted Cruz from striking the amendment completely, the crypto provision from uh, from the bill, because of the fact that he was a conservative, a Republican, or, you know, just somebody that they don't like to, you know, agree with. And, you know, it's a, a divisive time in this country and across the world. And, and yet, you know, you saw that. And it is just <clears throat> upsetting to see whenever it's like our industry is or Bitcoin for rather is not really going to uh, be affected by this. And uh, for the most part, we all know that like uh, Bitcoin can iterate around this and it is time to uh, start thinking locally. And if you're in like some of the districts from the senators who are proposing some rather atrocious stuff, you know, it's like uh, you got to take that signal for what it is and start moving, uh, moving appropriately. Yeah. I, I mean, like, man, like some of the, especially from lobbyists themselves, um, some of the reaction to this was just like effectively whining. Like not, not in everybody's case, but in some people's cases. That this is how laws get passed in America. Like have you never paid attention to Congress before? Like your, your job is supposed to be like paying attention to and working with Congress to get through this kind of shit to accomplish a goal. Um, like really? And it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the absurdity of not pushing Cruz's bill, which is like, again, did you really think that any of these amendments were going to get fucking passed? Put the weight, the public support behind the one that actually does something and it's, it's like again like the the loomis proposal it did not do what it claimed to do 
And I don't know why that is. I, I, I don't know like what the hell kind of educational failure led to that. I don't know. You know, I, I'm very suspicious of Wyden and Toomey, given donations from two entities that would very much benefit from this kind of shit restricting things like Lightning Network or any kind of scalable way to use it as money, because then the banks can come in and take that role. But it's it's it, it didn't even do that. Like a node does more than validate things. It has to in order for this entire network to function. And this idea that language protecting validation, but literally nothing else, comprehensively protects a node operator. No. Like, I, I, I just don't know what else to say except like, holy shit. Well, there's definitely zeitgeist to be had here in that we're doing, you know, trillion dollar bills with this or that label on top of them that just spend a ton of money. Uh, the idea that these things are cohesive at this point is well accepted as a joke, right? And that's even past the idea of pork barrel stuff that comes with the territory and has for a very long time. But now we can go an extra four or five days and create all sorts of public discussion, evidently, on a so-called infrastructure bill uh, on cryptocurrency provisions that are slipped in to what otherwise, you know, was evidently pork fest. And then it being publicly acknowledged by the treasury that, or publicly acknowledged the treasury would like those things to be in there for future spec. And then a decent sized public discussion of it and hence the many more days of senatorial discussion and then just ignoring it. And I, I'm also very fascinated once I heard that Ted Cruz did have this radical idea out there that we just not do this yet. And, you know, Loomis spoke about it well in terms of needing to take time at a committee level uh, to figure out how best to deal with it long term, hopefully in a framework uh, that's that's lasting and makes sense for what's going on here. Uh, but instead, we're playing reindeer games on top of trillion and a half dollar bills. Uh, so cryptocurrency is at the fore. Um, Evidently, this is a national priority. Yeah, but it, it's like, dude, what doesn't make sense to me is Loomis's amendment that effectively did nothing. Like, she's had Bitcoin since 2013. She is not a completely clueless, like, moron. So, like, how the hell did this happen? that that amendment was structured in a way where it, it didn't actually encompass in the language protections for the things it was trying to protect. It's a politician doing politics. I mean, that's what it looks like to me as far as just somebody that needed to put forth an amendment that looks, I mean, just, you know, in this fight, Right. Like it probably always was going to go with no amendments and it just go through the Senate the way Schumer put it out. And I mean, you know, this whole fight for the past week has been posturing. I mean, it's been like a show of, you know, the United States can still do something, which is pass this really shitty infrastructure bill, you know, which is a lot of crazy spending and a lot of really like not just pork, but some really bad policy. Very bad. And uh, stuff that's going to be industry killing and not just Bitcoin, other industries as well. And, you know, that's where I think Loomis knew this was going through the way it was. And maybe she's just playing politics. And yeah, I mean, like, here come the hearings on all this stuff. I mean, like Ted Cruz was saying, like, why aren't we having congressional hearings trying to figure out how this currency can help Americans and how can how can we help? You know, like, uh, I mean, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but, you know, he was saying that he didn't want to just willy nilly regulate this. He wants to have long form discussions about what is Bitcoin? What are cryptocurrencies? What are the block? What's the blockchain? How can it help these individuals? What's it doing to help people? And like in that case and scenario, I mean, we've seen it with Texas. I mean, it seems to be like they're just trying to open up the doors 
for this industry and not stifle it. And I mean, this country is just fractured and it's a bunch of signaling right now. So I, I think the other point that came up that I would agree with in there was, and that we've gotten back to a couple times is affecting uh, understanding and change around how these things are happening on a more local level uh, is probably the best form of attack to ultimately get it accepted at a higher level. Um, Cause you're essentially norming behavior, understanding and just environmental support for this sort of thing. And I think you're right. There are certainly localities that are out there doing that now, and they probably see some symbiosis to come that isn't seen at that high level yet, but that high level especially if we're saying treasury was influential in this sees several things from cryptocurrency pumps that you know i've read quotes that people out of those rooms uh act like they do not understand what's going on there but they see it happen they see essentially unregulated finance markets like DeFi. they can the very richest man in the world take to a place like Twitter and meme himself potentially many, many times richer and just completely redefine what money is while the same thing happens on message boards that have been around forever just by letting people talk to each other and now use whatever you know money they've got left over from their COVID stipends uh, to speculate on stocks, run all that crazy. And I, I mean, I just imagine if I was in their seat, I would feel like I needed to do something. And I guess that sometimes comes down to lashing out. So I don't, I don't even necessarily know what we've supposedly passed. Well, Absolutely. it's in the end, very bad for node operators, miners, anybody working in Bitcoin or crypto. Like, I mean, it's going to be very bad. I mean, it's uh, if this goes through, but I mean, like, Everybody's already saying, you know, the same old thing that we always hear from D.C. in those circles is, hey, you know what? On to the fight in the House. Like, it's going to happen in the House. In the House, we're going to get this thing solved, and that's where it's going to happen. We're going to hash this out in the House. Uh I don't know if we are. I don't know when the effective date on this stuff is, but if this goes through, this might be the trigger that kind of breaks up the states. If it passes, it'll go into effect in 2023. Um but yeah, this it's, it's it's getting through the house. Like, are you are you kidding? Like, like it is. Th- this is why this was attached to a giant bill like this because it's going through. Like, there's no and ifs or buts about it. So I take a little solace in years like 2023. So certainly they can come back and revisit this shit, and certainly they'll at least make noise about going back and revisiting whatever is out there as far as what changes because of it i I don't know and how much adoption will there be between now and then and how much more will people care or not care about this true one thing that's happening over time is for sure the degradation of the united states government i mean this was pretty interesting to see that they could even function i didn't know they were still going to these buildings and talking but you know Finally, they started to cross with our sector and I started paying more attention. And it was interesting just to see like everybody talking about, you know, Bitcoin and crypto and in a way where, you know, we knew it was always going to happen, but it's here. It's like uh, and it's going to continue to get crazier. Fucking Bernie. All right. Well, you guys want to dive into the, the next thing, I guess? Yeah, what's been going on with uh, BitMEX and FinCEN? Well, um, they have reached a deal with uh, FinCEN and the CFTC. Although, um, one interesting thing that is not quite clarified here in their write-up of this um is you know arthur and sam and so on uh but bitmax themselves 
are going to pay up to a hundred million dollars in fines um, for their lack of KYC. And they are simultaneously bragging about now being fully compliant with a 100% KYC user database. And, you know, they're, they're, they're going to diversify away from futures products into spot markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to cry inside a little bit watching one of the greatest degenerate trading platforms that has ever existed being so broken and cucked by the u.s government's regulators it's i just want to cry yeah it doesn't sound fun having a fully kyc bitmex that's ah what is this world we live in but yep they're going to uh hang up their cowboy hat, um, you know, put, put the tampon in their badge and start uh, concentrating on spot markets or spot markets, uh, OTC brokerages and uh, custody products. Um, so, yep. Eh, let's see if they can actually play with the big boys or they realize that they got where they are because of the cowboy hat. Yeah, and I'm interested to hear what happens to Arthur. I mean, what do we know the current state of Arthur? Was he uh, was he free and moving about, or was he under custody somewhere? Um, last I saw, there was the deal to allow him to fly into Honolulu for court proceedings, but otherwise remain out of the U.S. Okay. Well, it stinks, but uh, yeah, I'd like to hear an update on that just soon. Sure, everybody's okay. Well, it's okay. He's he's got enough coconuts to bribe the regulators. Yeah, and Honolulu is a nice uh, court location. I feel like you know if you're gonna fly into the, any of the fifty states, like that's one that's uh, pretty far away from the forty-eight or the D hand to DC. Uh, pretty close. I mean, it's in their jurisdiction or whatever, but still far away geographically. All right, well, talking about geographics and Bitcoin, it's looking like uh, the next domino was about to fall in line of uh, Bitcoin legal tender laws. However, the legislation being drawn up uh, falls short of Bitcoin legal tender. Let's talk about this legislation in Uruguay that is getting set up. Uh, this legislation will give a legal framework for every business in the country to accept crypto transactions as payment. And this will also allow two parties to transact in crypto. Uruguayan Senator Juan Sartori introduced this legislation to the Senate last week from the bill, quote, crypto assets will be recognized and accepted by law and applicable in any legal transaction. They will be considered a valid means of payment in addition to those included in the financial inclusion law, as long as they comply with the rules set forth in the law and, re and the regulations, close quote. Sartori's bill would establish that cryptocurrencies, quote, are products of free sale by those entities and individuals who wish to commercialize them, close quote, and states that any natural or legal person may receive and or send funds in legal tender from and to their own bank accounts or those licensed companies. And that's also from the law. If this bill becomes law, the licensing structure will have one license for exchanges and one for those taking custody of assets, then a third will be used to issue utility tokens with financial characteristics. That's not all. There's also regulation for mining, where the bill stipulates miners would need a special license similar to a doctor's and would need to be authorized by the Uruguayan Ministry of Ener Industry, Energy, and Mining to operate. And the bill also includes promotional training in civil computer and electrical engineering to meet this new industry. And now all of this would also include uh, compliance handed down by the FATF. All of these licenses will be issued by the executive branch to those following strict AML policies handed down by the Central Bank of Uruguay. Cineclaft, the AML secretariat, will keep a registry of virtual asset service providers 
and of those individuals or legal entities that wish to carry out activities in commercialization of virtual assets. Uh, Sen- Sen- Senator Satori's party is uh, is in the majority. They're the majority with uh, 17 out of 30 seats in the Senate. And we'll have to wait and see if this passes. But uh, here's another country, another infrastructure bill with uh, another large. Uh, well, this one's a virtual asset provision. So what do you guys think? Well, I like the not mandating its use as legal tender, but it sounds to me like this is going to be a very licensed, regulated, um, you better have any data we want on people and things um, type of setup. Yep. That's the way it looks. I mean, they've used the same, you know, signaling language talking about virtual asset service providers that we all know that that's the FATS language. And, um, you know, they're talking about strict AML policies across the board for this entire licensing infrastructure and the licensing gets directly issued through the executive branch. So, I mean, like there was like some, hey, Uruguay, it's the next major country that might take a step or it's the next country that might take a ma- major step in Bitcoin. But um, it looks like they're, you know, taking big steps to regulate it and make sure that it's uh, done in the way that they want to see fit. Yep. Ah, man. But we'll have to wait and see, you know. It's just a bill. It hasn't passed. And, um, but, you know, like we're saying, I mean, it looks like, uh, you know, these kind of, there's a kind of a lockstep mo- motion between countries to sort of uh, start to bring in the heavy hand of regulation in this industry. Yeah, yep. good to see him talking about it. Um, I don't know that the specifics are the best, but uh, got to have the conversation before anything can happen politically. So that's positive, at least. Yep, got to grab those silver linings where we can, right? Well, ready for the next one? Right on. So, yeah, what's going on with uh, Square's hardware wallet? Well, um, they are looking to hire a business lead for the project. Um, Looks more like a kind of marketing um, manager um, than really anything but the the role is generally kind of around trying to network between suppliers um you know potential vendors um in international markets as well as thinking through software or other things um that that might uh, be needed or wanted in conjunction with the wallet so it's kind of just putting together the whole business model to actually make this viable it looks like but um yeah you know i'm just gonna kind of repeat i really i do not like this this project and i don't like jack's attitude about this in terms of what he's said in in public before like he, he has literally argued to just remove a screen on a hardware wallet that lets you verify what you're signing because oh most people won't use that anyway um and that just seems like a reckless short-sighted um just convenience and push everywhere instead of maintain security attitude and just like the 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 nature of this position it looks to me like they're really trying to gear up to become a massive supplier or seller for this, which is also, I think, bad and short-sighted and stupid. The last thing on earth that should come to be if Bitcoin really becomes a global money is just a couple of massive hardware producers like this. Um, Ideally, you would have a large diversity, a large, you know, pool of different producers to pick from so that you don't have single points of failure or risk 
when there are exploits or design flaws or supply chain attacks, et cetera, et cetera. And so I just really, I do not like the tone and the seeming attitude with which this project is being launched. I think it's just kind of naive and short-sighted and has a fuck ton of potential to just go wrong in so many ways. So Square definitely has the reach around financial services and around uh, even apps like Cash App, et cetera, to be there for those next 100 million people that they're talking about and influence how they come into Bitcoin, how they custody Bitcoin, and basically get them addicted to a self-sovereign or semi-sovereign financial stack and own them as a customer. So they're and for a long time, right? And they could be doing this with 18 to 20 year olds, you know, college age student population, that sort of thing, just very successfully. I mean, completely convinced. And and they're in a good spot to do that because of their tie-ins to all sorts of other things you're gonna want to actually do with this wallet. And that's where their real value add comes in. Now, do they need to be focused on the hardware design? of that wallet, I would not say that's their primary competency. And honestly, if I was Square, I don't know if I would want that job. Like that would be a much better job to hire out while I flex my muscle at all the other things that that ties into. Because that's that should be off the shelf commodity hardware, which means you could swap in a lot of different things. You could have different generations. You're gonna have a standard uh, set of function calls, API, whatever you want to call it, that runs on top of that thing with the rest of your stack and focus on that stack and focus on your customers using that stack and really loving being your customers. Um, I don't necessarily know why you need to be the one to ship that hardware model uh, with your engineers, but it does put you in with the cool kids over in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I mean, th that's like one of the biggest points, man, is like hardware when you're talking security, like, I'm sorry, dude, that you don't just roll up and do that. Like, that's a specialization. You, you don't just figure that out. Like, you either put the resources, the time, the effort, the experts into that, or odds are more likely something's going to get fucked up. Well, yeah, supposedly gonna be open source so we'll see it get fucked up that's cool it will be interesting to see these standards evolve as more companies come to the decision that they need one of these key management devices to do whatever they're doing with people um you know ultimately there's going to be pressure perhaps for them to hit a standard as opposed to having uh like a supermarket value club card for each of them you just kind of have a wallet, right? I mean, it's just like th this, like hardware key management since the minute I got into this space was always one of the scariest things to think about as Bitcoin got bigger and bigger because there are just so many ways for things to be attacked, fucked up, like not be secure enough, just go wrong in so many ways as this space and the demand for them gets bigger. And it's like with so many fucking things in this space, it's like all the threat modeling, the concerns, the issues that people were thinking about five years ago, it's like they've just poof, vanished from everybody's minds into the ether they are no longer concerns. And it's just like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, it's more... You know, like, n nobody's actually thinking through the problems with things anymore. It's just stay positive, stay positive. Any, any criticism is FUD. And it's like, that. yeah, that's going to end well. Or competency focus yeah hardware wallets has always been a weird sector but it's just like uh it's for sure it's it's tough and i mean i guess like 
you're saying the money would be better spent or the applicate the resources would be better spent in investing in projects that are already out there and trying to make them more robust from failure. Yeah. I mean, like there's multiple DIY hardware wallets out there. There's multiple companies out there that have secure, solid products. Like go look at existing projects, go to a company and Hey, like if we throw money at you, will you try to figure out how to make something a lot cheaper without compromising security as much? But just this, like, we're just going to figure out this thing that there is no like that skill set is not here in in the expert sense right now so like what are you doing yeah and what's your magic win like are you actually going to advance the hardware wallet space you know i would i would ask you know very innocently or are you just making a hardware wallet because if you're not advancing that space you probably shouldn't be spending company time there but who am I to tell you that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the competition sometimes is just fierce. So it's better to just, yeah, like see, like it is fierce and I just wish it was more like uh, advancement in its ferocity instead of like, oh, you know, we do this better than them or whatever. Yep. But I guess uh, next little quick update from Jack. So I want to say like two years ago at this point, we covered um, Blue Sky, a, uh, a project that Jack set up with a team of, I think, five people last I saw to start working on turning Twitter into an open protocol instead of a centralized service. And um, yeah, I guess a couple days ago, five days at this point, um, they are going to be incorporating as a totally independent entity so yeah it's no secret that i am not really that fond of jack um but also it is kind of the situation that he has had less and less influence on twitter over the last few years um due to internal shenanigans so kind of an interesting move to completely independently incorporate like that um i would ask why if the entire goal was to shift twitter itself in a certain direction but um yeah yeah i saw that too it's like uh the development is the way to structure the business is that right well no it's just that they're like going like this was a team at Twitter and now they're going to incorporate as a completely different entity. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it does seem like if you're trying to do something that uh, is not Twitter, you got to step outside of Twitter. So, I mean, I'm just glad to hear that there's some sort of advancement on that because I mean, you know, Jack has, you know, has talked, you know, he's one of those guys. He talks this way, talks that way, and, you know, the platform does its thing, and it would be good to just see more decentralized social networks that are not so socially engineered. Mm-hmm. So what's going on with uh, Apple and Apple scanning, like I've heard of this and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know Janine's got to be all over this. Yes, uh, all of you have to burn your iPhones now. And do it. Uh, So on April 5th, last week, Apple announced that they would be, quote, introducing new child safety features in three areas developed in collaboration with child safety experts. First, new communication tools will enable parents to play a more informed role in helping their children navigate communication online, a.k.a. um, they will be giving parents more access to their child's messages on their phone. Cool. Uh, uh, The Messages app will use undeviced machine learning to warn about sensitive content while keeping private communications unreadable by Apple. 
Next, iOS and iPad OS will use new applications of cryptography to help limit the spread of CSAM, child sexual abuse material online. While designing for user privacy, CASM will, uh, CSM detection will help Apple provide valuable information to law enforcement on collections of CA, CSAM in iCloud photos. Uh, and they explain this in further detail uh, rather extensively in the post. Uh, it's quite long, but it uh, gives you a big, bigger picture of what's going on. Um, so first they say, before an image is sorted in iCloud photos, an on-device matching process is performed for that image against the known C, uh, CSAM hashes. This matching process is powered by a cryptographic technology called private set intersection which determines if there is a match without revealing the result. The device creates a cryptographic safety voucher that encodes the match result along with additional encrypted data about the image. This voucher is uploaded to iCloud Photos along with the image. Using another technology called threshold secret sharing, the system ensures the contents of the safety vouchers cannot be interpreted by Apple unless the iCloud Photos account crosses a threshold of known CSAM content. The threshold is set to provide an extremely high level of accuracy and ensures less than a 1 in 1 trillion chance per year of incorrectly flagging a given account. Okay. Only when the threshold is exceeded does the cryptographic technology allow Apple to interpret the contents of the safety vouchers associated with the matching CSAM images. Apple then manually reviews each report to confirm there is a match, disables the user's account, and sends a report to NCMEC, which I believe is the national uh, missing... Nash, something about missing children. Can't remember what the acronym stands for. If a user feels their account has been mistakenly flagged, they can file an appeal to have their uh, account reinstated. Oh, but there's more. Uh, they continue, this in innovative new technology allows Apple to provide valuable and actionable information to NCMC and law enforcement regarding the proliferation of known CSAM, and, if it, and it does so while providing significant privacy benefits over existing techniques, since Apple only learns about users' photos if they have a collection of known CSAM in their iCloud Photos account. Even in these cases, Apple only learns about images that match known CSAM. Now, maybe to the normies, this all sounds great and clean and good, but nope. Uh, within a few days, thousands of people signed an open letter demanding that Apple halt deployment of these proposed changes immediately. You can find the letter and the signatures and the reasons why at appleprivacyletter.com. It also has quotes from prominent organizations and people that are experts on security and privacy, such as the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, there, one of the quotes from individuals was Sarah Jamie Lewis, the executive director of Open Privacy Research Society, who had tweeted, If Apple are successful in introducing this, how long do you think it will be before the same is expected of other providers? Before walled garden prohibit apps that don't do it, uh, before it is enshrined in law, how long do you think it will be before the database is expanded to include, quote, terrorist content? Har quote, harmful but legal content, state-specific censorship. Um, there's also a very good essay, separate from this, published by someone by the name of Airform, which makes a connection between this and KYC processes, where they had, uh, in particular, banking trouble due to their rather common name matching that of someone on the OFAC sanctions list. Uh, and uh, so some n there's like a very extended um, kind of argument about the relationship between the two. But basically, as they say, just like the programmers who choose to match vote or match names against the sanctions list while the KYC and legal department handle the rest, Apple is matching all of the private photos on your phone against a list. This list is generated using something called a hash function. It turns an image into a number the computer can then use to make the comparison. Give me a second while I scroll. Uh, in my case, when the programmers punted to the KYC department and legal, a bunch of transactions were cancelled. In this case, the police will raid your house and arrest you for child porn. Just like me, one day you'll wake up and notice that something weird might be going on. Maybe it's a car parked outside your street. Maybe it's a feeling like people are following you. 
It won't be that alarmed at first. You'll dismiss it, but eventually it will come crashing in. Your door will be knocked down, or your door will be knocked open by SWAT, and you'll find yourself faced uh, facing armored people with guns to your confusion. They'll scream for you to raise your hands and then put them behind your head. They'll say, ma'am, we have a warrant for your arrest, and confused, you'll be walked out to a waiting squad car. Yada, yada, yada. They uh, will take your phone. Um, it just goes through like this uh, theoretical scenario. Uh, they won't find anything, so they'll return to the question. They'll return to question you, and maybe you've deleted the photos. Who knows? Let's pass it on to forensics and see what they come up with. Eventually, you end up being detained in jail. Your bail will be set high, and it's a whole scenario of basically explaining uh, that the same kinds of processes that you know people are investigated uh, from you know KYC stuff is similar to what will happen with this because the algorithms that they are or whatever the system they're supposedly going to use to do this comparison is not actually a direct comparison because obviously if you're doing a direct comparison of you know a hash of an image of a, like a known CSAM uh, against an image that you find in someone's iCloud account there could be minor differences that completely throw it off. So what they're actually doing is looking at, is it similar enough to a known image? And of course, there are many ways to make otherwise, uh, the example they give in the essay is like a cat that the that this one matching algorithm interprets as being guacamole. Um, so there are a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of ways that that kind of, content that, that seemingly matches a known CSAM could trigger this thing into thinking that you have child porn on your phone when actually you have a completely innocuous image. Um, and then you get a report uh, due to Apple doing this process automatically. Um, yeah, so this uh, all sounds wonderful. And this is why thousand over 5,000 people have signed the open letter. So Apple has magically found a way to stop people from flipping a single bit of data in a file that will completely change the hash when they go to compare it with their FBI hash table. Well, have they actually said where they're going to get the list from? Because I don't believe that the announcement said when I read it. The only place I'm aware of that you can get hash tables for stuff like that is the FBI. Cool. You mean the same uh, U.S. government agency that was trying to break Apple's iPhone encryption a few years ago to get access to yep. a... Oh, I wonder. Hmm. Yeah, yep. Hunter Biden's laptop is actually just a test sample out of their extensive collection for AI purposes, of course, to train their models to find these. So it's it's too bad it slipped out of the lab, but it should have gotten hushed up. You didn't do a good job on that treasury or whomever, you know, get on it. Um, well, you know, I don't feel so bad because, you know, should Apple happen to find some, you know, content that it deems should not be on your cell phone? and want to talk to somebody about it, you will be amongst the illustrious, um, the the astute, you know, likes of Paul Krugman, et cetera, for people who have been, you know, found with kitty porn on their laptops that, of course, don't know how it got there. So, you know, welcome to the club. It's going to be great. Um, I have a feeling this is ultimately going to lead to platform independent meme gardens, which is kind of what the internet used to be a little bit. Um, Cause how does it not? It, it can start here on hashes of one thing, but as noted, you know, hashes are pretty easy. Hashes are pretty portable. So, you know, what happens when somebody wants to protect you from bad memes? Yeah. This yeah, is just... gonna go down the slippery slope real fast. Yeah, I mean, I just think about the technical application that Apple's building and like, how is the, yeah, exactly like what these writers are saying, like, how is this going to be in the hands of like the CCP whenever it's somebody who's just posting a picture of something that, uh, you know, the, that the uh, CCP doesn't agree with and like uh, how quickly that can be 
you know, it's like people they have to worry about just uh you know not about uploading photos it's just snapping photos you know so you, before it was like if you uploaded a photo and then the ccp could kind of monitor that information and see like what you're thinking where now it's like if you just take the photo they're going to figure it out fun time and the stuff about um there's like more parental controls that are tied in with this. They show a few screenshots of the interface of that, where basically if you're a child um, and I guess your phone is enabled with these parental controls, if you receive an image that Apple or Apple's uh, algorithms deem to be CSAM, then you'll get a little pop-up window saying like these little emojis and something along the lines of oh this this might be a sensitive image are you sure you want to look at this be, you know be be aware that you don't have to look at it um if you do choose to look at it your parents will your parents will get a notification blah 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 and so i mean we're going to see how effective that is uh but yeah uh potentially I don't know. That's like as for me as as someone who wouldn't have wanted. I mean, I didn't have a, a phone to that would have any of this shit on it when I was a kid. Um, but I'm glad that that I didn't because that seems like a parental surveillance vector, especially if you do not have a great relationship between the child and the parents, and this system malfunctions where you get a photo that is not that and apple misinterprets it as that and now you're not only censoring you're censoring images but you're then forcing the child to notify their parents if they look at an image so we'll have to see how effective this is um but yeah i don't i i feel like i don't know if your child like if you're really worried about predators messaging your child and sending them dangerous stuff like this where you can't just have a conversation with them or if they'll be too traumatized by seeing that either like you need to your child needs to be taught some you know basic online safety uh strategies or your child is just too young to have a phone and i don't know like they need to mature better <laughs> or something i i don't know how i don't know what kind of i don't know who exactly this policy or tool is targeted at but i feel like there are better ways of addressing it than basically saying children child receives image that matches an image on a list which may not actually be dangerous then and, and you know it also affects the ability of the child to explore their own sexuality um which may have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with child abuse, but if Apple is possibly scanning the images, I don't know, because it might be they have a separate system for that, that they just scan the photo and determine whether it it's sexually explicit at all, even if it has nothing to do with CSAM. Um, they might just do that as well. I don't know, I'll have to look into it, but I don't, there's a lot of people who are like, this is not a good feature. Terrible feature. And it's very virtue signally about some subject matter that's just like from the epitome of like our society. I mean, like what happened to Jeffrey Epstein and all of that craziness? Like, and, you know, I'm sure he used an apple at some point. <laughs> it's just the excuse to get the back door in. Right. That's what that's I like think. Yeah. You know, Apple has done a lot of good things for people from bringing them hardware to services, experiences. It's essentially conceptualized a lot of our media consumption and a lot of our, you know, devices, I guess, at this point. So they, they have done a lot. But at one point, we, we got to this fork in the road that was the walled garden of the app store and since going down that road we've gotten more so and more so enmeshed in uh whatever it is it's not a garden it's more like a, a bog that once you step foot in it gets harder and harder to get out of every step you take and we we need to get out of the bog 
I, I don't necessarily know exactly how, but I am going to feel forced to get a Linux-based safe phone that's not Android, definitely, at some point, because these things just keep getting locked down harder and harder and harder, more and more audit, audited by external actors and service providers, and more so in ways that I don't want. I can certainly understand why I say as a corporation with corporate accounts, hey, maybe you want to check that box that says filter all emails and IMs for kitty porn. And you know what? I wouldn't necessarily hold it against you as a large corporation to do that. Check that box. It's that easy. Now we never have to talk to anybody about inappropriate content getting thrown around on our network. Just look at all the lawsuits. We basically just potentially stopped in the dust, right? Great. There, there's plenty of settings for this. But when you enable it at the broad spectrum on all consumers hardware as part of the service, it's it's just one step too baked in. And we all know that these guys are sitting there at the behest of the security state to deliver all the data anyway. So I don't know. Maybe this is just the the optics of the little toe in the big pond, but they're admitting that whole foot and that whole body that's actually just monitoring everything is, is there. Yeah, and also, I mean, to bring this in connection to Bitcoin, this kind of thing, this kind of justification could be expanded into other things. Like, what if one day they say, okay, if you, if you send a message or a photo that we determine to be related to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or trading or buying or selling whatever, then maybe the IRS gets a notification. <laughs> like, what, are they just going to add a, a, a bunch of like different reporting mechanisms based on like analyzing your messages where, oh, your message reaches a certain threshold or matches a, matches a certain thing, so we're going to generate a report now to the respective agency because you may have committed a thought crime. Uh, yeah, I, this is going to be expanded into other things. Yeah, and I'd it's be more perfect drugs. Like, any drug dealer who keeps using an iPhone is a fucking moron. This is a very powerful end to something like a social credit score um, in that, you know, who wouldn't want to buy an anonymized data feed of the hashes that are relevant to your, say, maybe even an anonymized phone, right? That's, oh my God, it, it's perfect marketing and it's perfect data stream for whoever wants it as soon as it gets normalized. Man, it just feels like the walls are closing in is that walled garden. It's uh, like you were saying earlier, it's a bog. And to find your way out, I mean, I've been trying to uh, work my way out of the whole surveillance phone, smartphone system for a while now and just uh, try and do the old flip phone or something because, I mean, it is getting that bad. And, yeah, I just wish there was more modular stuff that we could use. But I might just go back to the landline with the flip phone or, because this stuff is crazy. And this is why we can't, this is where Bitcoin for sure, it's like, we, yeah, we do need to think about that where it's like, what if you're just sending a QR code and that all of a sudden triggers a uh, notification to, you know, various agencies that you need to report to where if you're using Bitcoin, you really wouldn't want to. And that's just where I feel like, you know, Bitcoiners and in, uh, in this industry and the developers and like the hardware guys, like, you know, like I was saying that one time, it's like, I really want... Like uh, some sort of uh, hardware wallet I can uh, spend on that's dumb, you know? It's not in, It's not some kind of device where, you know, I can maybe just, you know, I, it's not a bunch of crap. I could just load on a, a wallet and uh, send and receive or, you know, it's not uh, something like, uh, you know, that Jade or uh, the Seed Signer and that sort of uh, direction. But, I mean, like, uh, ultimately, yeah, this is ridiculous for Apple. I mean, and it's just... It's another reason why we should all be trying to get away from those platforms. Where is my Linux phone? I want it now. Also, Pre I mean, I mean they they must realize that I mean like so at best they may catch some people who may or may not be sharing CSAM using their iPhones, but they're obviously not going to stop the creation of it through this method. Um, 
And also, there's probably going to be a counter response for the people who are actually creating this kind of material, which is they're going to probably start making programs or editing their images so that they can't, they're not like they like with the cat photo being interpreted as guacamole, they're going to just start using strategies so that these algorithms are not going to be able to recognize the image properly, which means that the entire industry the entire investigative field of like looking through the through these images and categorizing them is going to be screwed up um when i mean they might already be doing that i have no idea but there is going to be a counter response and so this is really just a you know cat and mouse game uh at the end of the day so i did do a little reading maybe around a month ago on the current state of the linux phone substitute handheld part of the world and you know, it's it's like anything else. It's like, why isn't healthcare better in the United States in terms of outcomes for how much we pay for it? And and why are people so resistant to doing it the way it's done elsewhere in the world? And you can kind of look at all sorts of systems and start to ask questions. And then you see that the entrenched players kind of like it the way it is. A phone these days, a phone as a phone is basically just a computer right? It is a computer with a modem in it. That modem is only so different than what people had a good, what, 25 years ago on their home computers. So, you know, the idea that we don't have generic phones, uh, I'm sorry, generic computer systems in common use on top of just, you know, modem cards that plug into cell broadband, you know, satellite, whatever sort of networks you want is kind of funny at this point. And I would venture a guess that's largely due to who owns a lot of the extant lines in these cases. Uh, so I, I am looking forward to us making progress here. Uh, the long and the short of it, according to what I read, was the operating systems typically in use on those devices are still getting customized to run quickly on limited hardware, uh, to have basically the pop that we expect so you can actually animate things, so you can have multiple things happen at once, um, so you can queue various things inside that software so they, they happen in a comprehensible order to the humans, uh, and so your UI can fit on that small device and function in a way that is always human usable. You never have a close button sitting off screen where you can't hit it somewhere. Uh, that sort of thing and all that stuff hard under development and my guess uh, does not have a whole ton of corporate backing because most of these corporations roll their own. That's kind of the big problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. All right. Yeah, one uh, one more attempt to undermine end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, I guess the FBI is winning. Maybe not. Maybe the open letter will do something. I do have to say, a lot of a lot of this issue may be eliminated by um, not having a phone. Yeah, opt out. I can say from personal experience, I have never received any content like this ever. Not even the voluntary kind. All right. Are you ready for the next up, guys? Yeah, from one security flaw to the next. What's going on with Samurai? So... This, um... I would not say is too bad except for the fact that Samurai Wallet and a few of their users um, multiple times, um, more than I can count, have suggested just using an old Android phone in airplane mode instead of a hardware wallet. Um, but effectively, um, they made some arguably dumb decisions in terms of implementing the pin lock for the wallet. So Samurai enforces using a passphrase on top of their seat. But anybody who uses it knows when you open up your wallet, you just have to put your pin in. 
which is a five to eight, um, you know, digit numerical pin. Well, usually when you have something like that used as the basis for an encryption key, um, you'll do something like salt it or stretch the key. So run a, a large number of hash iterations on it before you actually use something as a key and wipe whatever it's encrypting if you know you screw up the pin too many times well samurai's um key stretching iteration um ran fifteen thousand um sha256 iterations and for context um one password a popular password manager um uses a hundred thousand so undercutting you know a standard piece of software widely deployed not the biggest difference in the world in terms of entropy space but here's the fun thing their um pin lockout with three tries before it wipes everything and um just deletes the stored copy of your passphrase um it was not persisted so you could literally just do your two failed times and turn the wallet off and turn it back on and the counter reset to zero. Um, sounds kind of just like the screw up that led to the address reuse bug I reported last year where it kept reusing addresses on internet connection issues because it didn't persist the most recent used derivation path. Um, it just wiped it out of RAM every time the wallet shut down. Uh, so yeah, um, that is a basis. If you get your hands on somebody's phone or were able to compromise it remotely and snatch this, um, yeah, you can brute force in 140 days with a laptop, somebody's samurai thing or like in encrypted wallet. And yeah, there's a lot more computational power in the world available than a laptop. So from my understanding, they have fixed the, uh, the persistence issue um, so that it's actually persisting the pin counter across wallet um, loading instances, but are doing nothing um, to address the key stretching iteration length or anything regarding the encryption of the passphrase. So um, is this the end of the world um, versus a lot of mobile wallets? No, not really. But this is one reason why, you know, it is absolutely idiotic to do something like use an old air-gapped Android phone with Samurai as a cold storage device with no physical security. And as you can see with this vulnerability here, no real software security if the physical device is compromised. And, you know, just to start a fight with FUD, I'll end this with um, going, this is one of those instances where doing something with a passphrase besides memorizing it and re-entering it is kind of defeating the security gains there. So I assume to fight this, that I mean, to actually effectively fight this at a software level, you'd have to persist that into some encrypted storage somewhere, because otherwise somebody can just come along and, and touch some part of the code and, and do whatever with it, right? And to be fair, if I can come along and decompile your jar and, uh, and look at everything that's in there, your APK, which... I think it's pretty much a fancy name for a jar. Um, but uh, if I can decompile that and look in there, I could probably change that check that says, hey, have you tried this three times to have you tried this uh, 200 billion times yet? And just keep hammering that thing. Yeah, but it's, you know, this is pretty much give or take the situation for most mobile wallets out there. So in that regard for a hot wallet end of the world no 
but you should absolutely not listen to idiots telling you to use Samurai Wallet on an old phone as cold storage because if somebody gets their hand on that, you're probably fucking wrecked. Be weird. How, how much effort is your little sister going to go to? I don't know. And yeah, there's a lot of dumb setups out there. Just beware of them. What did Fidelity do, Rick? Oh, Fidelity got some more investment. Or Fidelity made some more investment. Okay, yeah. So let's uh, talk about what exactly they're doing. They're making moves into Bitcoin infrastructure is what they're doing. On uh, July 22nd, Fidelity Investment purchased a 7.4% stake worth approximately $20 million in Marathon Digital Holdings. They did this across four broad index-based funds, Fidelity Extended Market Index Fund, Fidelity NASDAQ Composite Index Fund, Fidelity Total Market Index Fund, and Fidelity Series Total Market Index Fund. Across these four funds, they have a combined market cap of $170 billion. With this purchase, Fidelity joins these other institutional giants who have invested in Marathon. Uh, those include Vanguard Group, which invested in 7.58%. Uh, uh, Susquehanna, 2.7%, uh, and BlackRock at 1.59%. And, you know, Marathon, they've got uh, 19,000 miners deployed across North America right now. And... You know, this is reporting with another with another hundred thousand miners already, you know, purchased and awaiting for deployment. You know, Marathon, they don't own hosting facilities and instead focus their energy on minor deployment and operation. Marathon CEO Fred Till said about the investment, quote, We are super excited about the institutional ownership. If you look at the change from last year to this year, and even the last two quarters have just been amazing in how much institutional ownership has grown in our stock. Close quote. He also said, quote, we are excited to see all the applications that are going to be rolled out on Bitcoin and the expansion of Bitcoin as it permeates itself into the kind of mainstream financial markets. Close quote. So it looks like uh, Fidelity made a pretty big investment into big Bitcoin infrastructure. What do you guys think about that? The vertical integration is coming everywhere. From everyone. I think there are a lot of smart investors out there that are looking at Bitcoin and they're they're seeing the opportunity for passive income in these mining vehicles. So I've heard about digital gold and how do you get that? You go mine it. Okay, very good. But there's also optionality here because if Bitcoin goes nuts. And, and breaks out somewhere, these miners are going to be very powerful financial entities just for virtue of being there, being at scale, being able to plug into things like banks if they need to, uh, being able to figure out how to optimize transactions, uh, just kind of being the nexus of this. So either it's just a really nice, simple passive income play, but the optionality, it could just be so much more. Yeah, it looks like it is. Um, it's setting up to be like you're saying, like the the institutions are coming and like they're investing in big and you know Bitcoin miners because they know like, hey, if you're wanting to play this game, you've got to get in on these different levels. And you know, Fidelity's been playing real hard with that. Like they uh, launched their own company, Digital Asset Holdings, and like uh, or it's Digital Asset Fidelity Digital Asset something. Uh, they launched that back in 2018, and you know they've been trying to make moves further into the industry as much as they can. And I mean, this is, uh, I guess their play when it comes to mining in North America and exactly, uh, where you do that. Hopefully, uh, this infrastructure bill doesn't ruin that in the United States and they're <laughs> stuck in Canada and Mexico or something. But this is wise, somebody like fidelity today is lined up to go after Coinbase's launch. 
And why is that? That's because as more and more retirement type vehicles and long-term investment type vehicles slowly get interested, get access to, and then start folding in percentages of Bitcoin, they just see the vertical integration there. You know, we're going to have to buy that from somewhere. And, you know, if, if we like the passive income angle of it anyway, if we think it's going to plug into things fun well anyway, oh man, just so much winning to be done here. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it does kind of, uh, I mean, I imagine that a lot of that lobbying money that was going towards all those crazy amendments this past week probably came from um, some of this. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's got its effect. I mean, it's definitely didn't really do anything positive, but I mean, I guess that's a positive, but yeah, we'll see uh, how things keep growing. I mean, hopefully uh, North America will continue to start moving towards uh, a thriving mining industry. I mean, dude, it's like any player in this space trying to generate yield out of it is going to eventually want to have some footprint in every layer of the stack. Like they're going to want that amortized, like risk managed exposure to everything. Like nobody's going to want to take, you know, the risk of we're just doing this one thing. Yep. And so go the incentives in Bitcoin, and that's uh, it's great. Speaking of incentives and Bitcoins and revolving doors, Janine. Binance. <laughs> yeah, uh, in episode 212 last year and then 266 at the end of April this year, I talked about the OCC taking in Brian Brooks, at the time chief legal at Coinbase, as the acting comptroller of currency, and then Binance US hiring him as their new CEO. Well, uh, it seems like this position had an even shorter life because on August 6th last week, he tweeted, King's crypto community, letting you all know that I resigned as CEO of Binance US. Despite differences over strategic direction, I wish my former colleagues, colleagues much success. Exciting new things to come. So, where will the B-man go next? Back into the public sector, perhaps? More revolving door? Or sticking in the private sector? Who knows? No information. Hmm. This is interesting, because surely that guy was getting paid over there, right? And surely there was enough prestige associated with that, and he understood what it was at the beginning, I would think. So, I think that's the right question. Who just hired Brian Brooks? Somebody with a lot of money that doesn't have ties to China. I'd bet. That's true. That could have been a bad look. Interesting. You ready for an autism? Oh, yeah. Like, uh, what's the autism today? So, uh, about two years ago, core dev James O'Byrne um, did some work um, re-implementing the hash table or hash map that the data structure that's actually used to store um, and access the UTXO set. Um, and the, the kind of logic was that right now it just uses a default um, you know, structure in C++ that's completely unordered. And so his idea was you know, kind of order that a little more structuredly and you, know, you can optimize the, the read and write times for accessing that. Um, which he did, but that came with 2,000 um, lines of code that touch consensus critical things. So that kind of just fizzled out and went nowhere. Um, well, developer Martin and Curry, um, I hope I said that right, from Dynatrace apparently went diving through James's old work and realize that they could still optimize um, at a much lower level 
the actual um, physical memory access um, and how that's structured. So not the data structure um, like James did, but just how underneath that data structure, the physical memory is being accessed to, you know, store and grab the actual raw bytes. And that that optimization could be done in a lot more narrow context with a a lot more ease and auditing and making sure things get done right and still wind up with a potential 9% um, speed up for grabbing UTXOs. So he's going to be doing that and hopefully in the next release or, or two, um, yeah, we have a, a close to 10% uh, speed gain in terms of grabbing things out of the UTXO set, which is a huge fucking win because really long term, the size of the UTXO set and how fast you read and write to it is probably the biggest technical scaling bottleneck of a Bitcoin node. Damn, great job, James and uh, Martin. Woo, woo. Got that 10%. All right, so what is, like, uh, that's awesome, really. I mean, like, uh, you know, get that optimization. Now, uh, is there some more autism that's here? Like, what is this? So, uh, Blockstream put together a uh, demonstration of a simplicity implementation of Taproot and also demonstrated really fun things. Universal SIG hashes. So a SIG hash flag is effectively a little bit flipped that says which part of the transaction you signed your signature commits to. Um, you can do fun things like only sign an input or only sign a specific input and output. Um, you don't have to sign the entire transaction so that it can be updated after your signature and people don't have to come back to you and get it re-signed. But the, it's very, very limited um, and very specific, the, the number of SIG hash flags there are and what parts of the transaction they do or do not commit to. Using simplicity, um, you can make them completely arbitrary. So instead of the pre-selected parts of the transaction that you could commit to in the Bitcoin implementation now, um, you would be completely able to arbitrarily define the SIG hash flag and what it commits to. And even take this to such a crazy flexible level that I could say do something like sign with a custom SIG hash flag um, with a time lock that would automatically increase the fee that a miner got every time a block came in so that I could just push this transaction to the network and, oh, it doesn't get into the next block. Well, then the SIG hash flag and the script structure automatically gives the miner a bigger fee if he puts it in the next block. And if he still doesn't, then an even bigger one in the next block. And yeah, um, really just holy shit, um, when the hell are we going to get simplicity on Liquid so that this can actually be deployed and shit built with it and everybody can start thinking about whether or not we want this in Bitcoin proper. Um, because yeah, there, there is a lot of amazing potential here. That sounds awesome. Like, I mean, just, just like to talk about simplicity so long ago and, and Taproot and like to see them both uh, put together. That's incredible. That's, uh, man, we definitely are in 2021, but only four months to 2022. All right. We got two more things, guys. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the next one's pretty quick. So uh, let me just pull this up real quick. So 
It looks like uh, National Cash Register, or NCR from the New York Stock Exchange, is making moves to acquire the company Liberty X. You guys probably know Liberty X or know of it. They set up little kiosks in various locations to sell Bitcoin. Using close connections with ATM operators like Cardtronics, they've been a model that's attracted NCR. Tim Vanderham, CTO of NCR Corporation, said, quote, Due to growing consumer demand, our customers require a complete digital currency solution, including the ability to buy and sell cryptocurrency, conduct cross-border remittances, and accept digital currency payments across digital and physical channels. The Liberty X solution will accelerate our ability to rapidly deliver these capabilities to the market. Close quote. Moving forward, NCR will offer the Liberty X capability as part of its solution for banks, retailers, and restaurants. NCR's digital wallet and mobile applications will provide these capabilities across NCR's phys physical and digital touch points. Chris Yim, co-founder and CEO of Liberty X, said, quote, We look forward to offering NCR's customers the ability to quickly and easily offer the digital payment and cryptocurrency capability consumers want, while significantly expanding the scope, scale, and reach of our software, close quote. So, yeah, it looks like uh, Liberty X is uh, moving forward into maybe, uh, you know, the restaurants and retail and bank space where, uh, you know, they used to just be in convenience stores uh, like gas stations and uh, some grocery stores. And, um, you know, I remember talking to Liberty X uh, a couple of years back, trying to think about them as a payment solution for the cannabis industry. And it was just a little bit too much risk for them at the time. But. I guess uh, things are growing rapidly in the retail sector and people wanting to, you know, buy Bitcoin to spend Bitcoin. And so I guess this is the uh, solution that NCR has. I mean, this is just uh, an initial release in their acquisition of Liberty X. It should, uh, as long as nothing holds them up, it should take place later this year. Yeah, so this is uh, a story about a little Bitcoin company growing up, I think, in that I believe Liberty X uh, has made software stack that runs on other people's hardware uh, as like a client application. So you could have uh, ATM somewhere, the ATM pr provider decides, ah, yes, we would like to support some external applications on our ATM, and we get a cut of that throughput or something. And Liberty X has built these types of applications for dedicated hardware for some time. So got to be giant val validation that a company called National Cash Register Company that specializes across this hardware stack comes and buys you up as a software provider for such things. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, this is – see, like, dude, this I think is infrastructure-wise really the type of thing that is going to push adoption at the pleb scale to the next level because it's like I think we really are at the saturation point of like, you know, how many people are going to jump through the hoops to sign up to a broker, to an exchange, yada, yada, but – you put these ATM machines everywhere densely enough and they're just right there, click a button, like that really might start changing a lot of people's minds who just hear Bitcoin and go, oh, and then go back to thinking about other shit they have to deal with in their lives. Yep, yeah, it gets you into fringe markets where the commitment is not nearly as high as in what you might think of as a traditional Bitcoin market. So we saw this with the coin processing kiosks that would pay you back in Bitcoin uh, some time ago. Yeah, Coinstar. Yes. Just, I mean, all, all the fucking things just keep getting laid out. It's, yeah. Bitcoin's Bitcoin. growing up. I was going to run with that uh, to credit card points in that uh, that also brings in this huge market that's out there that potentially hasn't done the, the homework on Bitcoin, but when they can passively receive it by things they do anyway, it just, it, it has so much potential to expand uh, the surface area of the Bitcoin market. Yep. It's going to be, well, yeah. So race to bitcoinization all right janine i think that leaves us with you up last 
Yes, apparently this is the one that we've all been waiting for. Uh, oh, yeah. yes, yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, AMC chairman, uh, AMC, the famous from the uh, the good old days of um, GameStop stock going nuts. Uh, AMC chairman and CEO Adam Aron talked about their Q2 results, which are linked in the show notes, an extended statement, and cash position on CNBC. And towards the end of that segment, it wasn't very long. It was maybe less than a minute. Um, he said, uh, we're going to get quite involved in the world of cryptocurrency. We announced yesterday that we're going to be accepting Bitcoin as payment for online purchases, for AMC admissions and concessions. There's much more than that we can do with cryptocurrency because we have an avid population of customers, blah, blah, blah. Um, he said they were also going to add support for Apple Pay and Google Pay, or I think that was actually mentioned elsewhere. But um, he also he what he did say is that they were going to look into alternative programming uh, more like UFC fights, so not just movies. Um, and he didn't provide a timeline or deadline as far as I could tell anywhere, but on the earnings call he said it would happen once they have, quote, the information technology systems in place. So... Yeah, um, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, if maybe you were just a person who never went to the movie theater, AMC is one of the largest uh, movie theater uh, businesses in the United States. They also have movie theaters in Europe and other places around the world. So um, yeah, for AMC to be accepting Bitcoin would be a very big deal. Definitely the most important story on the docket today. The memes are combining. We believe there is high meme synthesis occurring in the natural world and that we can achieve synergies by interacting and melding with that synthesis, but on a corporate level. So obviously this doesn't matter at all. Um, I love that it's out there and I, I think it's great. This, this is like the snake eating its tail. This is the Ouroboros. It's AMC notices their stock is worth way more than our, anybody's argument says it should be under basically any circumstance until he death of the universe. And then it, it comes back around and it's like, what's an even bigger meme? What can we interact with to enhance our memetic value? I want to hear a story about shorts that they're going to play in place of movie trailers that sell you not only cryptocurrencies, but also meme stocks. I want to hear AMC and Robinhood team up to meme you ahead of every experience inside the theater. I think there are definite synergies to come with this announcement. I just think it's going to be hysterical if they start accumulating and holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet through this and um, that winds up affecting their valuation and taking all the meme investors, giving them indirect exposure to Bitcoin and then eventually shoving them fully down the Bitcoin rabbit hole um, and, and getting over their silly obsession with meme stocks. Oh yeah, it's going to happen. When they actually accept Bitcoin, they're, they're going to jump on top of somebody's stack, whether it's Coinbase or Fidelity or NYDIG. They'll ultimately build some front end over that. I suppose they'll let you pay online in this. If they're really smart, if they cutting edge the crap out of it, they'll let you pay some lightning dollars and just get that instant feel for it. And other than that, I mean, I, I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but... I kind of don't see them using this in person yet. Like you walk up to the theater, you wait around outside until your transaction clears. Like I'm, I'm not seeing that as the interaction model. So it'll be fun to see what this ultimately means. Uh, just thinking out loud, I mean, it seems like the largest installed base that could potentially insta transfer them Bitcoin are PayPal users. So who knows? That Hopefully they base. accept Lightning. But yeah, because think, think of so. I mean, because movie theater tickets I mean have gone up over the years, but not enough I think to where they I mean it would be a greater risk to do 
an on-chain payment for everyone with that, it would make more sense to do Lightning. Absolutely. But, I don't know, do you get, like, the image I got in my head when I saw this announcement was, oh my god, what if someday, because they also said, he also mentioned, like, doing alternative programming, um, as in, like, other types of showings besides films, so, like, what if in a few years you can go to an AMC theater and watch uh, Bitcoin podcasts? <laughs> Will they be desperate enough? Tune in to find out. Will they I, play Block Digest? <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll probably try to go the sports bar direction. They're, they're already halfway there with selling booze at a lot of locations. Fair. But, uh, yeah. Guess it is final thoughts time. I got a final thought. Uh, I listened to a podcast uh, just because I've been catching up on stuff recently because I've been you know, busy a lot. And, uh, I caught up on a, it's not too old podcast, but it's a, what Bitcoin did with, uh, yourself and Drav, um, where y'all talk about, uh, vulnerabilities of the internet and, um, some, uh, you know, some pretty vital vulnerabilities within Bitcoin. And it was really, uh, awesome. It was a great interview compliments to yourself. And, uh, just, if you haven't listened to it, you should probably go listen to that because it's just, a. Definitely, you know, it's interesting topics and it's good to, you know, go through and, you know, Peter McCormick's not too bad. So go enjoy uh, an episode of What Bitcoin Did uh, with yourself, with Shinobi and Drop. Don't crap your pants or sell your coins after. Yeah. Well, I'll chime in since we spent, you know, almost a week focused on the Senate and the Senate kind of focused on us. Um, don't forget, nobody's talking about Bitcoin legality out there, certainly yet. Nobody's saying you can't do any of this. It, it's interesting to me because the fundamental part of this, what it all kind of rolls back to is should two people be able to share a secret? Should I be able to write you a message? And do you write me a message? Should that should that be able to happen? And they're just our messages. Nobody else gets to mess with them just yet. And should we, as a collective group, get to keep some kind of common account? Is is should we be able to have a system that we can all contribute to and agree on something? And I don't think either of those things, when they get boiled down that far, um, are going to get illegalized around here. So. They, they can bitch and moan and whatever else they want to do about whatever regulations surrounding it happens. I think we're past Bitcoin illegality, et cetera. And, you know, I think that gets lost in, you know, concerns around what's to come or what legislation means or whether these people even have any idea what they're talking about while they pass laws. Uh, the good thing is, nobody's attacking Bitcoin at its root here, as in, should it get to exist, which is a long ways from just drug money. I like it. That's an awesome point. What do you got for us, Janine? Uh, well, I want to, I don't know, I thought it was a funny tweet from Naraj about a week or two ago where he said, I'm looking to build my team of expert enterprise metaverse consultants. Having read Snow Crash is a plus. Having had someone explain it to you in a bar is acceptable. No other requirements. <laughs> yeah. Always with the memes. I Maybe... would also... Go ahead. Maybe he should spend less time memeing and paying attention to what's actually going on in the Bitcoin space. Hey, hey. Okay, I would like to suggest, because we keep bringing up this concept of having autisms during the show, I think we should have an autism counter, kind of like how CinemaSins has a sin counter when they review uh, movies. <laughs> um, yes, we should do that somehow, but that would probably complicate the editing a lot more. Uh, every time Shinobi says autism, we should have the cover up. Um, Somebody's going to have to go through the catalog and count the previous autisms. But, 
My final thought is that, uh, well, by the time this is published, it will have probably already happened, but tomorrow, uh, tomorrow as of the moment we're recording, there is a preliminary hearing for uh, the High Court in the Assange case in the UK uh, that will make, I, I don't know what the agenda is, it's only two out. I mean, it's two hours long, so most likely it will just be kind of a uh, gather round ye wigged people, although they don't have wigs, it's not that exciting, unfortunately. Um, gather around and schedule for hearings. No idea what they're going to get up to, but uh, stay tuned. Oh, I'm going to keep mine short and sweet. Stop talking to senators, start talking to sheriffs. Catch you later, punks. Later, everyone. And now we stop talking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>